Okay, hey podcast listeners, welcome to What You're Reading, the podcast where I connect with fellow book enthusiasts to chat about our latest reads, the topics that fuel our bookish obsession, and all those things that keep us glued to those pages. Welcome back, everyone. In today's episode, we are sitting down with my friend Tyler from Thrifts and Tangles. Tyler is a sustainability content creator, meaning she does a wonderful job sharing with her audience on how we can make sustainable swaps in our life for a more eco-friendly lifestyle. I invited her on today to talk about her ideas and thoughts about what sustainability looks like in the book industry. Are we falling into this zone of overconsumption or does consumerism look differently for the book industry? I really enjoyed our conversation and I can't wait for you guys to listen. All right, let's get into it. <laughs> Today, I'm joined by my lovely, lovely friend, Tyler. I'm so excited to have her here. When I think about like reading and especially like both fun reading, but more so like reading to gain knowledge, like Tyler is like one of the people where I'm like, oh my gosh, have you read this book? Have you heard about this subject? Um, She's like really everywhere. Um, But aside from her being one of my book besties. She's also an amazing YouTuber, content creator. She's got a great Instagram um, where she talks a lot about like eco and sustainable living. She's helped me make a lot of like sustainable swaps in my life to live a more sustainable lifestyle. So I could gush all day about Tyler. I'm going to go ahead and just introduce you guys. Let her come on and say hello. Tyler, welcome to the podcast. Please say hello to everyone and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, JJ. Oh my gosh. Thank you for that intro. I feel like you were hyping me up. (laughs) But I'm so happy to be here. Um, Like JJ said, I am a a content creator. I have a blog called Thrifts and Tangles, and I also have a YouTube channel. And basically over there, I encourage people to give thrifting, sustainability, and their natural selves a chance, all with the goal to live a more eco and earth and money conscious lifestyle. Um, And my whole thing is like, I want people to be able to build generational wealth, but also I want them to be able to like, be able to be alive on a planet generations to come. Like what good is generational wealth if the planet is dying? So I read a lot of books about I feel like the books I read are a little more on like the depressing, like realism side of things. But like, I need that wake up call in the world. I need to know the world is not like all the sunshine and butterflies and (laughs) all those things. And I really like books that are all about like just learning. I I just like to learn. So thanks for having me. Yes, yes. I'm so glad you're here. So before we get into our discussion, and today, guys, we are going to be talking about, if you couldn't tell from the title, we are going to be talking about sustainability and like what that kind of looks like in the book industry for, um, you know, when you're either purchasing books or thinking about buying books. Um, I know at the time of this recording, there are like different protests going on in regards to like who you should support and who you shouldn't support or I mean, you can support whoever you want to. So I don't say it that way, but just like being more conscious about where you're spending your money and everything. So we'll get into that whole subject. But before we get there, do you want to share with us the last book that you read? So the last book I read was The Financial Feminist by Tori Dunlap. I actually did not finish the book and It's only because during the time I was reading that book, I also started like a financial course. And so I put more time and energy in the course. But what I read in the book was very, very informative. I really enjoyed it. Um, She really talks about like finances in a way that acknowledges the systemic oppression going on. And it's not just like Mm -hmm. stop buying coffee um, if you want to be rich, like she actually addresses the systems that are in place and that people have to overcome. So it was a really good read and I would like to finish it soon, hopefully. Oh my gosh. Oh, that sounds really good. And I do want to go ahead and just note that Tyler's also a new mom to the most precious baby girl. So like, I I can imagine like the fact that you're even like still reading within like the first year of having a child. I don't have kids, but I've seen like how bananas your life can get once you start having children. So I just applaud you for still keeping up your reading habit. <laughs> as a new mother. So I do want to just throw that out there. Thank you. It's funny when I was trying to figure out what what the last book I read was, I thought it was what to expect when expecting. I was like, it's going to be a pregnancy book, but I was like, no, I read a book after that. 
Um, so yeah, I, I'm trying to still get my reading in. I think we'll talk about it later, like how I get the reading in. Um, yeah. What I'm currently reading, I don't know if it counts, but I just got my library hold today for our book club read, uh, The Personal Librarian by Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. I haven't started reading it yet, but like I just got the hold. So I'm going to say I'm currently reading that, even though oh, I haven't yes. officially no, it counts. It's your current read. Oh, I'm excited to read that one. Um, Brittany, who you guys have, um, by the time this episode airs, you ha- would have already heard from our other book bestie, Brittany. She suggested that book for um, our book, our buddy read uh, for the month of December. So I have it too sitting right here. So I'm excited to jump into that. Yay. I love it. I want to quickly go back to your financial book and something that you said. Um, and I feel like I may have talked about this um, just a tad in one of the episodes I recorded with Brittany. But um, I think it's so important to change our mind frame that stop spending money in certain things is going to make us generational wealth, right? So in college, you know, I took out all the student loans, didn't really know like that, that, that I probably shouldn't, but it was like, how else am I going to pay for it? my school, my education, they're giving me all of this money. Didn't know I should, probably shouldn't have taken out everything that they gave me, but they gave me all of this money and I took it and I kept pushing. Right. Um, and then, so after that facing, you know, debt and stuff, I did what a lot of people do with Dame, Dave Ramsey, um, took financial peace. I think it has a lot of great principles, um, in regards to, you know, how to quickly get out of debt, how to pay down your debt, um, some of the principles about you know living within your means and not above your means. But I do think that there is this underlying message that I don't know if he consciously or subconsciously is putting out there about like, stop buying the $6 latte and everything will be fine. And I like in Rachel Rogers' book, um, We Should All Be Millionaires, where she's like, or how about you just learn how to up-level your income and then you can buy the $6 latte because it's in your means. So I like kind of that reframe. I'm going to have to check out the book that you mentioned because I think it's so much more than just stop spending because that doesn't equal now all of a sudden I'm rich, right? Exactly. And it's funny because Tori Dunlap, she's the author. She has a whole Instagram account where she kind of talks about things too. If you don't want to read the book and want to just consume like quick little content on um, how to become a financial feminist, but she is very critical of Dave Ramsey and I'm here for it. I love it. (laughs) And I don't know much about him, but she basically, like I said, he doesn't acknowledge some of the systems of oppression that faces us as women and especially as black women. And she kind of acknowledges that. So yeah, it's a good read. Let me know if you read it, if you like it. Yes. I'm going to add that to my list. And guys, just a reminder that everything that we mentioned here is going to be in the show notes. I probably won't like link to Dave Ramsey, but all of the other stuff (laughs) is going to be down below in the show notes. So let's just go ahead and get right into the topic from there. And again, guys, we're talking about sustainability. And as I was thinking about this, I I didn't want to approach this from like, how can we save trees more, right? Um, because that's a behemoth of a task. And you know, how are we going to do that? Not saying that it, that this might not result in some saving of some trees or anything like that, but more as, as the consumerism as a whole, um, some of the, the different things that maybe we could do some of the swaps. And this is why I love Tyler guys is because there are swaps and things that I've been able to do quick example of using like reusable, um, cotton, like wipes for like my face when I'm taking off my makeup. I, you know, I just use the regular like square cotton things and throw them away. And it wasn't until I saw Tyler doing a video where she was like, no, you can buy them and then you can just wash them and you have them. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, hello, why has no one told me this? So like those simple little things that can actually make a pretty big impact on our environment. So what, if you want to just kind of give us like an overview of like, what does sustainability mean to you? So for me, sustainability is minimizing the negative impact you have on people and the planet um, just to ensure longevity and survival of generations to come. So, or for generations to come, I should say. So it's really focused on not just the planet, but also the people, it's creatures. Like there's a ways people, some people are sustainable in the fact where they only care about the planet, but then they're letting a lot of labor be exploited. So I feel like it's Mm. all interconnected. And I feel like it's not sustainable unless you're looking out for all of those things. Oh, that's a good point. Okay, so labor is included. And that sustainability. Yes, for me, it is. Um, 
because I mean, there's like, a, there's a lot of, I don't want to go on the rant of it, but there's a lot of people who are really like hardcore vegans, but then they're not talking, they're not, they're only talking about the animals, but they're not talking about the farmers who are, you know, producing our food. So I feel mm-hmm. like you can't leave certain things out of this conversation. So yeah, okay. sustainability, it's all interconnected, like everything in this world. I like that. I like that. Okay. So how did you like get into like sustainable living? Like what was the light bulb moment that you had that like brought you here? So I was like the biggest mall rat when I was growing up. Like I would go to the mall every single Sunday with like $20 in my pocket. Like, And me and my friend would split the $20. So we both had 10 basically and we would like share wardrobes. But we were shopping every single Sunday. We'd be at the mall from open to closing, like literally 11 to seven, like just having the time of our lives. And we did this for years. And then I became a broke college student. And I was like, okay, like I can't be spending all this money at the mall anymore. So I really got into thrift shopping and that was kind of my introduction in to sustainability. But at the time I didn't know it was sustainable at the time I was only thrift shopping because I was like, wow, this is a way for me to get even higher quality clothes at a low price point, And it's very affordable. I could look cute going into my low college classes. So I was still over consuming at the thrift store. So I was over consuming at the mall at first. Then I went to the thrift store. I was over consuming at the thrift store. I would go to Goodwill outlet in Vegas. You could get 50 pounds of clothes for $10. Oh my gosh. I was going crazy. And I was going there like twice a week. Like I was doing way too much. So then I watched the documentary it's called The True Cost, and there's another documentary called River Blue. So The True Cost really sheds light on all of the problems within the um, the fashion industry. It talks about specifically there was a factory in Bangladesh that collapsed and killed thousands of garment workers, mm. and they were creating garments for some of these really popular brands in America that people wear constantly. And so I never really heard about the garment workers before and really saw the conditions they were working in. And so that really shed light on that. And then there's a documentary called The River Blue, where it talks about how fashion pollutes our waterways. And Mm -hmm. there's a river in China, I believe, where they know what the it color of the year is based on what color the river is, because the fashion industry is not responsible or sustainable. And they are just putting chemicals into these rivers. And these are rivers that are, you know, people's livelihoods, people have to drink and clean in these rivers. So it's really upsetting. So once I learned about that, I kind of dove into like a deeper rabbit hole about, okay, what other industries are horrible? (laughs) It's it's kind of like, once you dip your toe in, like, I'm like, dip your toe in, you can, you know, dive deep, because there's so much to uncover whether it's in the food industry, just labor in general throughout history. We know it's slavery and things like laborists or laborers are always being exploited. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of led me on this journey to be more sustainable, just to reduce my impact, to be more mindful about my overall consumption, because the whole thing with the true cost is like, okay, you bought a shirt for $10, but what was the true cost of that shirt? Like Mm -hmm. who was being exploited for this? What is their background? What is their history? what is their living conditions? Um, And then you really understand like there's no reason that these people should be living in such horrible conditions when we could just all be more mindful about how we're consuming. But that's not, I don't know if you could blame the consumer for that so much or if you blame the businesses, which I think you blame the businesses Mm -hmm. and the owners of these businesses who are letting these things happen. Right. Right. No, I, I agree. And then that, you know, that kind of leads into the perfect segue into like how we relate this or connect this to the book industry. And, you know, I I was going to talk about this later, but we'll go ahead and just jump in this. Now there have, there's been a recent like discussion happening about is the book industry or publishing more so becoming like fast fashion, right? Where we're seeing all of these creators and myself included buying stacks and stacks of books, you know, and then not getting around to them and then going out to read, you know, buy more books. And is it leading to, you know, this is more of this boom, this second boom, I guess we're having of the book industry because, you know, it kind of died out and, you know, post COVID it's, it's kind of gone back up. But, you know, this boom that we're seeing is this, are we going to look at this in 10 years from now and say like, like that was the start of like fast fashion in the book industry. And I think it's an interesting conversation about consuming 
and maybe like what some of that, I don't know what some of that desire is to constantly buy things, books in this instance, um, even when we've got enough sitting here. I mean, literally, I think I counted the other day, I've got 73 physical books between my shelves and my book cart that I have not read. So where, you know, where is this consumerism bug? Like, where should I be concerned? Or where is it just like, well, I love reading, so it's okay. No, I feel you. And I feel like it, that really happens in a lot of industries too. So in the fashion industry, in the book industry, and a lot of people blame social media for this overconsumption. Like specifically mm. are blaming the short form content, like on TikTok, what do they call it? Book talk, right? Like yeah. people are watching these influencers who are saying, go buy this. This is the best thing ever. They're probably telling them to buy it from Amazon, which that's a whole nother <laughs> podcast in itself. But like people are constantly consuming content and being sold these things and they feel like, okay, I have to buy, I have to buy, I have to buy. And then a lot of those items usually end up at the thrift store. I'm a big thrifter. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you, I find like brand new untouched books at the thrift store all the time. It's because mm -hmm. people are just, it, it's it, it's a cycle and it's not circular. The system's not circular. So once it goes to the thrift store, okay, let's say you buy a book, you don't read it. You're like, okay, I need to declutter. I have too many books. I need to make room for more books I want on my bookshelf. You send it to the thrift store. That thrift store then tries to sell it. It doesn't sell there. It probably goes to like an outlet after that. Like for mm -hmm. example, it goes to a Goodwill and then it would go to a Goodwill outlet for like last chance to buy. And then from there, I was trying to research. I was like, does it go to landfill after that? Because that's what happens to a lot of our clothing. Mm -hmm. But from what I saw, they say they recycle the books, which I mm -hmm. really hope that's true because paper is one of the most recyclable resources in the U.S. and it could be recycled up to seven times and made into new products. So it would be really nice if that's what is what happens. But I mean, that's an ideal world. It probably does end up in landfill. I don't quote me on that. Right. I do agree that that, that is probably what happens because yes, we, we do, we buy. And I can't even begin to tell you, like, as I was preparing for this episode, and I was kind of thinking about like my purchasing habits, like how many books that I have just bought because social media has said, this is the it book. And I've hated the book. Like I didn't really do a dive on, you know, what the, you know, what the book was about or who wrote the book or anything. I was just seeing it everywhere. So it was like add to cart, buy. And then I didn't like the book. And so now it's like, well, I just spent money on this book. And so like, you know, adding to the problem. So I think being part of that is being a, a more aware reader. And I don't think the problem is necessarily buying books, but I think it's kind of maybe the blind buying of just over buying um, books because everyone's reading it or this is the it thing without you know, a little bit of back end knowledge to even know, like, is this something that you might even be interested in? I bought so many thrillers and I'm not a thriller reader, like maybe here or there, but I'm not a thriller reader. So the fact that I have 10 thrillers on my to be read thing, like is, is bad on my part because I really have no intention of reading these. So what do you do with, with what, what do you plan to do with those thriller books? So I have a Pango account, um, which is like a secondhand selling account. So it's you're buying books from other readers across the US. So I've posted those, taken pictures, posted those there. You know, it's usually for a markdown price. So for a hardback that you would have at Barnes and Noble paid $30 for, it's on Pango for like eight. 10, eight to ten dollars if it's a new you know if there aren't many of them on there you might be able to push it up to 15 so I'm not making my money back right I'm I'm you know I'm getting some money but I'm taking a loss on on this book and so that's usually what I do is I do that I sell them on there um or I'll send like my little cousins they love to read so I'll just take a picture when I'm doing a clean and like hey these are the books I have you know, are any of these on your list? If so, I'll hold them for you till the next time, like I see you or it, it goes to the thrift store, which, you know, I feel, I don't know, it feels interesting about because I go I do thrift a lot for books. And I loved going I love going through the thrift store for books. Again, I found um, Cass by Isabella Wickerson, I believe is her name, brand new book at Goodwill for four bucks. Like I could tell like when I opened it, the pages were crisp and clean, never been opened. And I got it for four bucks. So 
you know, on that end, it's, it's great to go thrifting for books, but then it's also like, especially for that book, like, wow, someone bought this, something about the caste system that is speaking about what's going on, you know, in America, how we got here, where it started from, and you didn't even read it. So it was also like a little bit of like a dang, like you couldn't even, (laughs) you couldn't even open the book. I do want to say, um, I know that authors are like, please buy my book, right? And it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's good for the authors when the books are purchased new. So Mm -hmm. I understand, like, I'm all for secondhand. And I honestly don't own books. I don't own physical books. I just don't have the space. I have a 600 square foot apartment in LA. um, And I don't have a lot of room. I don't have a bookcase. I literally have my books in a cabinet. And so I don't own books for that reason. But then when I hear authors talk about, no, like you, I really would appreciate it if you were to buy my book or if you were to get on the wait list for my book. I'm like, okay, there probably isn't necessarily a problem buying the books new, but I do think to your point, it's the overconsumption and buying books just because it's hyped up and not really mm-hmm. because you want the item or it doesn't hit your like your values and what you care about in the book or the right. dramas you really like in the book. You really are just buying it to buy. So I almost feel like for that situation, I, do you read your books twice? I don't read books twice, but I know people do. So, that's the other thing. I can, there have been maybe two or three books that I have ever reread. There are some that I have purchased this year where I like read, I bought or I read from the library and I bought it because I was like, I want to own this book because I want to reread it. But I have not done that. Cause I'm, I, so I, I understand the beauty of like having a library. Like one day I would love to have a room with all the books and my daughter can read all the books. But then it's interesting because it's like, wait, but people aren't rereading the books. But because I was going to say, if you do want to kind of check out a book before you buy it, read it at the library and mm-hmm. then buy it. But then if you're not going to read it again, it's like, do you have to own it? I don't know. That's a personal choice. Yeah, no, I, I do. I think it's a personal choice. And guys, we're not saying like anything is like bad or good. It, you know, just literally having a discussion about, you know, some of these things that are, that have recently come up. But it is, it's, it's interesting because I also, depending on the book, will not loan them out. Like, <laughs> like if you want to read it, like I'll bite like, okay, like my little brother, he's had my Malcolm X book for almost a full year. So the other day I told him like, hey, I just bought you Malcolm X. So how about you bring me my copy back? I'm going to inspect it and make sure it's still in good condition. And here, I just, I, I let me give you this copy because yeah, I need my book back on my shelf. Now, am I about to read it? No, <laughs> but it's the fact that it is not on my shelf and I know I own it and it is not home with the other babies is a problem. So I think it is something about having it. I think it, it sparks some kind of joy sometimes too. seeing these books behind me that I loved reading. I had such a great experience. It's almost like when I pass by some of them, like I've got Before I Let Go by Kennedy Ryan sitting like right behind me. When I look at that, I just remember like, oh God, that was such a good book. Like I have that feeling again. So I do feel like in that aspect, it's good. But sometimes, you know, where it's like going to Barnes and Noble, it's like, it's okay to leave empty handed. Like I try not to right? more so when I'm going to an independent bookstore, like I would rather like spend a dollar here. So I try not to leave an, an independent bookstore empty handed. But if I leave Barnes and Noble empty handed, like I have to remember, like, it's okay. I don't have to buy anything. I also have a ton of things sitting at home that I could just as easily read so So then from what I'm hearing then does that mean your bookshelf it's like how people collect mugs or like collect their favorite thing like it's a collection of your favorite books you don't necessarily have to reread it it's just a collection of all the books that you have loved yes that is a good way to put it yeah the books that I haven't liked I, I have donated or given away or they're in a pile to give away because yeah, there's no way that I want to continue to keep that on my shelf. And even the books that, you know, once upon a time, especially, you know, when I was sitting at home in 2020, it was like, oh, I'm going to read all of this. And I no longer have an interest in it. Like just having that moment and being realistic where it's like, okay, you're not going to read this. You no longer care about this subject. You no longer are maybe supporting this author. Like it's okay to just let it go. With that, um, I want to ask you, so I know you said you don't like have physical books, 
what would like what would a book have to do for you like right now in order for you to buy it like if if you weren't moving if you were still in the same you know studio spot that you're in like what would a book how would a book have to move you in order for you to say yeah I know I don't have anywhere to put this but I need to own this book so it's funny because I don't think we've ever talked about this like outside of the podcast just in our day-to-day life but I don't like to own novels or like, I don't have to own any books. Like I don't, the only book I really like to own or types of books I like to own are coffee table books, which I don't know how you feel about coffee table books, but I love coffee table books. I just love like the aesthetic behind them. I love that they're conversation starters. If you have one out on the table, like when a guest comes over, they can kind of like thumb Mm -hmm. through. And I think those are great books to own. So there's a book, um, there's actually a thrifting coffee table book that I would like. It's called Big Thrift Energy, um, and it's by Virginia Chamley, and it just has, like, the most beautiful curation of, like, thrifted homes on the inside, and I'm like, ooh, I would love to have this book. It's funny because we're doing Secret Santa at my job, and I put it on my Secret Santa wish list. Another book called Live Beautiful by Athena Calderon. And again, it's like a home decor, like really beautiful aesthetic Mm. book. And I feel like those kind of books I look forward to for like inspiration. So I Mm. will love owning anything that's like a conversation starter or inspiration or a coffee table book that I know I can always put out, whether it's for like just for people to actually read when they come to visit or Mm -hmm. just for decor. Like I really am into decor and I feel like you could just stack books in threes and the coffee table books are like extremely aesthetic compared to some of the novels. So those are the only books I really care to own. I own some books that I've been gifted like by friends and family or like by authors. I've been to events where the author will give me a book. Like I have Mm -hmm. Biting the Hand by Julia Lee. She sent me a personalized copy. I was like, I'm forever keeping this because I do love that book. But again, it's like stuffed away in my cabinet, all those books. Like, I can't even tell you what books I do own because I never go to that cabinet. But yeah, the coffee table books, I'm all for. But how do you feel about coffee table books? I don't think I've ever heard you talk about those. You know what? So no, never. Growing up, we didn't have coffee table books. We had on our table was Essence Magazine and Jet Magazines. Like that, that was what was always on our table. So it's really funny because... Um, on like my entryway, I don't really have a coffee. Nope. I don't have a coffee table, but like on my entryway where like I leave a light on downstairs at night. I don't know. I think it's just habit from growing up. Like you, like, I don't like a dark, a completely dark house. So I leave the light on down a light on downstairs. And so on that table, I have some of my old favorite essence magazines like one with Michelle Obama I think I have one with Regina King Tracy Ellis Ross Queen Latifah like some of my old like favorite essence magazines is what is sitting on that and it's interesting because people come over and they'll be like oh my god you still have this or whoa look at this oh my gosh I forgot she did this cover you know things like that hopefully the audience listening is aware like that once upon a time like we would like subscribe to magazines and get them shipped to the house this was like oh my gosh this was like maybe my college days like I always had an essence magazine on me and so like I've kept all of the ones that like touched me in some kind of way or inspired me so that's what's on my coffee table and then more recently I did get something I got historical black phrases just because I thought that was fun for people to come over and see like some of like the you good you know what like the phrase and like what it all of the definitions of what it could mean or like I think there was one like where are you going where it's like you know it could actually mean like where are you going but it could also be like when you're in the car and someone makes a wrong turn like you don't say like you made the wrong turn you say where are you going like it's what happened here this is not the right way so I like that I think those are the types of of things that I could con- continue to keep on my table but I've never really explored coffee table books I'm gonna have to I'm gonna definitely check out that big inner um the big thrift one um that you talked about because that sounds really interesting it's so cute and colorful and like so much inspiration. But I feel like too, with the Essence magazines, those are totally filled with inspiration. So I yeah. could totally see those being a great coffee table book. Okay, so no owning books. So I have to ask, like when it comes to your daughter, because I know I bought some books for the baby shower and I was like, I can't wait to buy all these kid books because I don't have kids. So like, let me just buy all of this for you how how do you see yourself like managing um that 
So for my daughter, it's funny because, oh my gosh, I love that I had a Dr. Seuss themed baby shower that JJ actually hosted. <laughs> Thank you, JJ and my yes. best friend Celeste. They both hosted it together. It was so cute. But I, they had it where instead of giving a card, they gave um, a book. And I love that idea so much. It really built my daughter's book collection. And I am all for her having books. She has a little basket by the couch and it's actually a pretty big basket but it's filled with all her books and the ones that don't fit in the basket they are at my mom's house and my mom used to work at the library and she is totally into books she's always finding new books for my daughter so I think it's really important for her to really dive into reading get into reading and children's books I love children's books so much like I love seeing the illustrations like they're so cute in children's books if you teach your child how to like carefully handle a book, like that can last them forever. We have my daughter, we went to my mom's house and she had like the entire Dr. Seuss collection, which there was books I had no idea even existed. And she had those saved from, from when I was a kid, like some of those are like books that she just found at the library that they were giving away at the library bookstore. She's been collecting these for years, waiting to have a granddaughter. And she was like, one day I'll have, so Parker has an amazing book collection. But I read to her at night and like, I, I, I mean, you can't have, I personally like eBooks and Mm -hmm. I just recently bought a Kindle. So like I can consume books that way, but my daughter, you're not supposed to show a screen to a baby. My daughter is nine months old. Like they're not supposed to have screen time until I think like two years old. So I'm all for her having the books and it's such a fun bonding moment. Like I love reading to her. I read her two books at night, every single night. And that kind of. Um, triggers her wind down time. Like she understands, mm-hmm. okay, it's time to go to bed because we're going to be reading a book. I put her pajamas on, you know, I wash her up, I put her pajamas on and then we read a book and then um, she watches like a little projection screen and she goes to bed. So mm-hmm. I love children's books. The only thing is she's very wiggly and she doesn't pay attention to the book so much. Like sometimes I'll like clap it. And it's funny because my mom, she's, Again, like she's like the best grandma to my daughter. But when she reads to my daughter, like she does all these fun voices and expressions and my daughter is captivated and she will sit still when my mom reads to her. But when I read to her, I try to like do the same thing. But of course, mommy is not the same as grandma's skills at this. So when I do it, she's kind of like distracted. So I'll like tap the book and be like, hey, look. So I feel like I'm not really seeing the illustrations because I'm kind of reading through it kind of fast that way that she doesn't like, you know, I want to finish the book to her, but like she's like, bored of the book Um, yes I want to get her attention so what I've been doing is I bought her some touch and feel books and that gets her engaged and she likes the books where you can like you know it makes a sound like she has a book that has different animals and you make a sound but it's so cute there's a book I got her it's called 10 things I love about you and it has two little it's like a black mom and a black daughter with their and the daughter has like a little puffy curly hair and it, I got it from Target and I was like oh my gosh this is the cutest book I've ever seen and that's probably her favorite book cuz there's a heart that's like fuzzy on the cover and she can touch it and she just gets so excited to kind of be engaged and like it's like more interactive so I try to get books like that for her she has like an animal book where they have different fur for her to touch so I found that's a way for us to kind of like I'm not like, come on, look at this book. Like she actually wants to read and look at it. So it's exciting. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. Totally love that. And I think it's, again, we're, we're talking about like, not totally saying like buying books is bad or overconsumption, you know, like, or you shouldn't buy from big companies or anything like that, but it's, it's all in moderation, right? And it's all in the intent and in the way that you do it. And the fact that you've, you know, you found something that she really loves. That's so cute. You mentioned having a Kindle which in my mind is very on par for you as, you know, being sustainable. You're cutting down on some of that consumption while you're also helping the author and helping the author comes from getting it from the library and buying the book. Like I I also, I want to remind you guys that like library books count the way that you're checking it out when you're on those wait lists and it's like, oh, 12 week wait and stuff like that. Like that is a, that's great for the publishing companies to see that, that people want these books, even though you're not physically supporting, like by going and buying a a hard copy, that still is great traction for the author. So having said that, how do you feel, because we kind of said this a little earlier, but having a Kindle, how do you feel about having Amazon is really the leading industry 
in the ebook field right now? Like, did it feel weird for you? Because for me, I, you know, I bought the Kindle and I didn't really think much about it when I bought it a couple of years ago. But when I heard you were buying one, like my question was like, ah, like, did, how did that feel for you? Did, did it like get you a little bit inside or were you like, no, like this is, I don't want to say lesser of two evils, but this is like a purchase that will continue to give back. I feel like I I was like the latter. I was like, this is a purchase that makes sense for me. But I had only heard about Kindle. I didn't even know there were other options. So I, I didn't do any research. I was like, yeah, I'm getting a Kindle. That's why I hear everyone talking about not realizing there's other brands I could have bought that weren't necessarily from Amazon or, um, or made by Amazon. But you know what? I... I do go to like Whole Foods every now and then. Whole Foods is owned by Amazon, right? I went to an Amazon Fresh store today with my mom, which was a weird experience. I was like, wait a minute. It was like, you didn't have to scan anything. Like you just checked out. It was weird. So I will give my money to Amazon sometimes. And there's a reason Amazon is the giant that it is, right? But like, oh, I won't. I don't think I'll buy a book from Amazon though. Yeah, I can't yeah. do it. I can't do it. I'll buy other things from Amazon, but I have to make sure it's practical for my life and it makes sense because mm -hmm. they always say there's no true sustainable consumption under capitalism. So you kind of have to pick and choose your battles. But the Kindle made so much sense for me. I was always reading eBooks that I got from Libby, the library app. I was always reading it on my phone. So having it on the Kindle, it makes it so I don't have any other distractions. Like I don't have Instagram there where I could be like, oh, like, am I reading or am I actually like seeing this Instagram notification and getting distracted? So I do like having the Kindle. Right, right, right. And for context, guys, you know, I understand that Amazon is usually the cheaper option, but there is a reason for that. Amazon intentionally sells books at a loss to dominate the industry versus when you're going somewhere like bookshop.org or your independent bookstore, like the, they're selling it at the price that they need for the store to continue and for their employees to make a living, right? So there's nothing inherently bad about buying books from Amazon. Like you said, sometimes, you know, I, I think I was looking for, oh, when, you know, when I was trying to find some books to read on Palestine, like nobody had the book that I wanted to read except Amazon. And it was kind of like, you know, like, well, I can't find it anywhere else. Like I literally have to buy it from them. So like there, there are unavoidable times. There are, you know, hey, financial times where it's like, you know, I want this book and that's where I have to go. So we're not saying that buying from Amazon is bad. We're saying just being conscious and aware of when you have other buying decisions to kind of think about that and flesh that out. So when I am financially able to purchase a book from an independent bookstore from bookshop.org or, you know, even Pango is such, you guys, you can find some of the new releases on Pango. Those options I will buy first instead um, of going to Amazon. But I, you know, like I said, I understand that sometimes, especially depending on where you live, it may not be an option. I know some people live in cities where their nearest Barnes and Noble or even their nearest Indy is quite a ways away where they can just get something shipped to their door overnight. So I, I totally, we understand that. We're not saying like you're a bad person. If you're buying from Amazon, we're just having the conversation of considering other options when when you're able to do so. Yes, because Amazon just makes it so convenient that I think people forget there are other options. So I'm all for shop local first, shop secondhand first, you know, whatever makes more sense for you. But they have uh, thriftbooks.com usually has books for really great prices. The thrift store we already talked about that has really great prices. If you have to buy from Amazon, I'm even like, I, I, I don't like buying books, so I don't ever buy books for my Kindle from Amazon. I'm all for the library, but like support your local library. Libraries are amazing. So I feel like it's almost better to just get it from the library. Yeah, yeah. No, and you know, with that earlier this year, so it's kind of gone downhill since there, but for the first quarter of the year, I had a goal of not to buy any books. For the first three months of the year, I was not buying any books. And what I did when I wanted to read new books is I would get it from the library. And then if it was a book that I loved enough that I wanted to own, 
I would put it on my list of a to buy book. And then I would look on Pango. I would look on thriftbooks.com. If I would go to the thrift store, different things like that. And then I would purchase it. But I really liked that because I just, I felt like there were some books that I read and I was like, oh, this is cool. But I, I, I would be okay not having this on my shelf. And I was so glad that I hadn't purchased it. I just had to get over that, um, that, that itch that in, you know, itch where it was like, I need to buy a new book. Like I had to really rein that in. Then, you know, the latter half of the year, I kind of got laxed and here we are. I do. I agree. I think the library is a great way. What are some of the other ways that you think um, are a good way to get, to get books? You know, we're not necessarily talking about the newest popular books, but maybe just something that'll, you know, pique your interest in, in a different way to get some books. Yes. Uh, Before I answer that, I'm going to say this is so similar to the fashion industry conversation that we talked about earlier, because it's that it's that fast fashion. It's that fast consumption. It's that convenience. So for slow fashion, it's really saying, okay, instead of me going to the the mall and buying exactly what I know I can get, it's scaling back. It's taking time being like, do I need to get this piece of clothing? You could do it for the books too. Do I need to get this book immediately or can I slow down? Can I find a more mindful way to make this purchase and find a way to support someone who's going to do a little dance when I buy the book versus, you know, a big old company. So it's funny that it's like the exact same language being used for books. I wonder if there's like a slow reading community or a slow book community that's combating, you know, like the fast fashion of books, because that's exactly, it's like make a list actually waiting to see, do I still want this book? How can I get this book? You know, like it's not that instant gratification. But with that being said, some of the places where I feel like are really great to get books are I've seen book swaps in LA. I'm sure they have them all throughout the country where people come together and just exchange books that they no longer want. Those are usually free events. I was like, that would be such a cool way to talk to people about the book. You could say, oh my gosh, this was my favorite book, but I'm letting it go. And like, you guys can have discussion about who your favorite character was. And it's just giving that sense of community surrounding the book. I think that's an amazing way to get new books. I love the little libraries that are popping up, like just in neighborhoods, the free little libraries, I think they're called, where people will just have a library outside the house and you take one and usually it's take one, give one. Mm -hmm. Um, But some of them just let you take it. Like, I think that's such a cool way to read new books, maybe books that you hadn't even thought of reading. Um, And then of course, check out your local thrift store for some books, check out your local library. But I think those ways are, oh, you know what? I actually found a lot of really great books at the flea market too, for like a dollar. So going to things like that, even estate sales probably have good books. I'm just checking out those places. Yeah. Yeah. And making, you know, do it's, it's outside of the box. Like you said, like thinking like it may not be going to your thrift store may not be as convenient as logging onto Amazon, but you might be surprised at some of the ones you found and some of the gyms. Like I found some old copies. I think I bought like a very, like one of the first print editions of waiting to exhale. Um, it was, it's like a black cover and it's got like the neon, like cutouts or whatever at the thrift store. I love the little libraries. I'm seeing a lot of them pop up more and more. And I think it's, it's so great. The last thing I want to touch, cause I know we're coming close to time is one of the things that I think, and, and you know, I, I haven't done a ton of research on this. It's just what I've been observing and hearing this conversation about is publishing starting to push books like fast fashion is a lot of these special editions and I love a good pretty beautiful special edition cover right but when a certain book had five like book subscriptions who were all doing their own separate cover of the same book I, I, I looked at that and I was just kind of like, all right, guys, are we starting to do too much here? And I don't know if it's fair to say that one subscription should have the right to do this book and another subscription shouldn't because, you know, I don't want to take away from, you know, those subscription boxes are other small businesses. So I don't want to take away from the small businesses, from the, you know, the amazing um, artists who were doing these cover work and stuff like that. Like, I don't want to take away from that, but It's just very interesting to me that certain books get picked for these special editions and covers and others don't. And there, there, there are now 
some new subscription boxes where they're focusing on black and brown authors, which is amazing. But I don't know. I think I just wonder if that's adding to the consumption, the overconsumption issue where it's like, okay, I have to buy the regular copy or I don't have to, but I'll buy the regular copy because I want to read the book now. And then in three weeks, I'll be able to get this special edition copy, but this special edition copy has this. So now I want this. And it's like, you like people are, are having like this one book in three and four different special edition copies. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to hate on anyone. And I'm not, I just, I guess I just don't quite understand it. And I don't know if this is potentially going to be adding to this overconsumption issue that we're talking about. I think it will. I didn't even know they were doing that, but I feel like it's, it's curating that sense of FOMO, like, oh, I have to have that one. Oh, like, but already I don't own books. So I'm like, why do you need to have five of the same book? I don't understand. <laughs> I, and it, make, it makes me think of what the future of books will be. Because I'm like, if that's the case, why don't they just have it where there's a slot where you can like switch out the cover or, you know, like if you could buy the cover only and don't have to buy the whole book. Like, I don't know what the future of books should be, but there has to be a more sustainable option and something that's a little more like cost conscious because books are not cheap, right? So you're spending a ton of money to get all of these special editions. Um, I don't know. That seems excessive for sure. You know, and then I think about the people who were maybe just want a regular copy of the book. Like, (laughs) you know, people are like, I don't need the special edition. I'm just trying to get a regular copy because I just want to read the book or, you know, them doing it and them anticipating and doing, you know, second and third runs of it. And now because four other subscription boxes have also offered a special edition of this same book, now you have a whole stock worth that you can't get rid of. I just find it, I, you know, I've been watching it in a lot of the conversation and things on um, online. I just find it really interesting, but also it's interesting and exciting but it's also on the flip side. It's very, I'm very interested to see where this, where this leads and where this goes and how we'll be viewing like how the publishing and, and to, to note with that, a particular publishing company mass produced their books that had so many issues. Like people were missing pages. Pages were in the book upside down. The spine was reversed and you know not in the right direction and it's just like what's the is the point of that to get them you know the fast fashion like the point of this is to just sell 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 like to where we're not caring about the quality of the book anymore like now we're now the quality has gone down because we cared more about the way that the book looked like yes i would like a pretty book but i also want my book to be right like i know some people were you know, laughing online, like, oh, ha, ha, ha. like, it's okay, I could just turn the book the other way for the pages. Not me. No, I want I want my book right. I paid for it. I want it right. Like I need my book. I would rather the inside be correct than, you know what I mean, than to have some of these additions. So I don't know, I'm just... But that's, that's all, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's the quality, right? And it's, it's not it sounds like they're getting a lot like the fast fashion industry. <laughs> it's a shame. And it, it's, it's interesting because there have, it seems like there's been, like you said, like a resurgence of readers and people are excited about books again. But then again, because of social media, are they only caring about aesthetics or are you actually reading the book and finding value in the book? And our whole society is about quantity rather than quality. So I think it's like really taking a look and like why are ask yourself why are you buying this are you buying this because it'll bring you more value in your life and like really figuring out what your values are and not just being sold to and falling into that trap of oh I have to have the next thing I have to have this the newest you know most popular book like it's really just looking within and asking yourself what do you value and do I need to spend my money on this Right. Right. No, that, that's a good point. And I think that's a great way to, to leave it in terms of like, if you're trying to be more conscious um, and, you know, about the books that you're buying in regards to like sustainability and, you know, making sure that you're not ending up with lots of books. Like I am in my current situation now where I haven't, you know, I've got these stacks and stacks of books that I haven't read. If, you know, if we're trying to minimize that, I think it's taking a step back and not feeling so pressured to purchase the quote unquote it book, whatever's popular on Instagram, book talk, TikTok, 
um, check it out from the library, download, even downloading a sample first. And you know what? I noticed this on Libby the other day. You can do that from your phone. You can read a sample of the book from your phone. Um, so even stuff like that, because there are sometimes there are books that I open and like within the first chapter, I'm like, I don't like the way this is written. This isn't going to work for me. And it's like, dang, like I should have... <laughs> taken some time and done that before I purchased this book because now I'm stuck with it. And now I got to figure out, you know, which way I want to go to get rid of it. It's slowing down, doing the research. That's what I do in the fashion stuff. I slow down, I read more about the brand, you know, find out, you know, do I want to support them or not? Or do I want to buy this or not? Do that with the book, slow down, read your samples, and then go from there. Don't just mindlessly (laughs) buy these books because the books are beautiful. So I can understand like just being like, oh, they... So and so, who I respect online, says it's great. I, mm-hmm. I think it'll be great too. But if you guys don't have the same reading taste, then you're going to be in that situation where you're stuck with a book that you're like, "What the heck did I just buy?" <laughs> right, right, right. Well, so coming to an end here, do you have any? I mean, I know we're we're talking about you know consumerism, but do you have any book recommendations that maybe someone could grab from the library or that they might easily be able to find on a second hand? shop that would help continue educate or continue the conversation on just living sustainably yes so i have three recommendations one is the afro minimalist guide to living with less by christine platt and her take on minimalism is from an african-american's perspective which you don't see a lot in the mainstream media so it's a really cool book about just being more mindful as a consumer. So it's a really good book. The next one is Consumed by Aja Barber. And this one just talks about colonialism, climate change, and overconsumption. So it's a really good book. It's very eye-opening. And she's like, oh, she's a great person to follow on Instagram. She's always like going in on like the problems in the world. Like it's just very, she does it in a way that's very entertaining, but like, real as well like she is just a very educated woman and then the last book I'm going to say you are going to probably disagree but I think people should get Parable of the Sower by Octavia (laughs) Butler because this book kind of talks about it's more of a novel but it talks about the problems that we will be facing if we don't fix climate change I'll just leave it at that Yes. So um, for context there, we read Parable of the Sower. I don't even know if it was this year or last year. You know, everything blurs together at this point for one of our buddy reads. And I was not a fan of that book. (laughs) I was not a fan. And I I think it, it was a great, it was a good concept. The writing was fine. I think it was the writing style because it was mostly um, the main character, Lauren, I believe her name was. It was mostly like journal entries. Like we were, it was her point of view. We were constantly in her head. We're like piecing together things from her journal. There were things that I wanted her to like, oh my gosh, like let's explore this. Like when something exciting happened and then she was on to the next day. So I think those kind of things definitely put me off about the book however I am in the minority with that opinion most people love this book so that might be something good for someone to check out from the library absolutely (laughs) yes it was written I think in the 90s but a lot of the stuff she wrote maybe even earlier than that but a lot of the stuff she predicted is happening as far as like climate change and some of the things we're facing so I think it's like and oh crap, we got to get our stuff together or else this is all going to become a reality. It's one of those kind of books. Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, and it, it was really interesting. And, you know, I definitely want to give one of her, you know, another book of hers a try because I think it was, she was a great writer. You know, she's a, I could tell she's a good writer. I just didn't like the particular style of that book. Okay, so we're going to end out here with a final round. I know we kind of covered some of these, so we'll just go through these quickly. Um, This is called There's a Book for That, where I just kind of spit questions at you and you give us the first thing that comes to your mind. So first up is, what was your favorite read of 2023? It was one of our book club reads, All About Love by Bell Hooks. Oh, I love that book. It was so good. Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you love that. We had a good, last year we struggled with our book club. But this year, this year we had some some really good picks. Okay, so next is what is a book that you love reading to your daughter? And I think you already said it, but if you could repeat the title for us. 
Yes, it's called 10 Things I Love About You. And it's Danielle McLean. But the book, when I bought it, I thought it was 10 Things I Loved About My Daughter. But it's written from the daughter's perspective. So it's talking about 10 Things She Loves About Her Mom. It's so cute. Oh my gosh, I love that. I love that. Okay, so we already talked about, I don't know if you have a different one. We said a book that you think everyone should read, which is Parable of the Sower. Do you have another one that you feel like everyone should be reading? Yes. So this one's like more about like race and race relations in America, but I think everyone should read Ta-Nehisi Coates' Between the World and Me. The It's like a letter to his son. Oh my gosh, that's the one of the best books I've ever read. I think everyone needs to read that. Yes, I, I second. That is a really good book. Is there a book that everyone seems to love or currently be loving that you didn't like or you're just not interested in reading? I read it so long ago, but I can't, I couldn't get into it. The Alchemist. I know that's an unpopular opinion. People love that book. I don't even remember why I couldn't get into it, but I finished it and I was just like, nah. Oh, that's interesting. That was in my early college years. That was like one of my favorite books. I should probably reread it, but that was one of my favorite books. That's interesting. We should do a book club on it. We should. That would be, oh. 2024, that would be great. Is there something that you're looking forward to reading in 2024? And it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific book, maybe uh, something that you want to continue to learn or something that you would love to see in a book. So there's actually a specific book I want to read. It's called Wear It Well by Alison Bornstein. And she's a fashion stylist and she does a lot of really good TikToks, but her whole thing is about consuming less. She's like, shop your wardrobe and she kind of talks about find ways and new ways to style your wardrobe and as a new mom I feel like I'm like oh I need a whole new wardrobe I don't know what to wear I'm breastfeeding now nothing fits right like I'm in that weird boat but she's like you know take a step back look at what you already have and try to make do with what you have and like she's very creative and I love her content so I know her book is going to be really good and she has a course that you can buy or like a styling session you can buy with her where she like goes through your closet and like helps you piece together pieces but she's like if you can't afford that or if you don't want or have the time to book a session get my book like I will teach you everything I would do in a styling session so you could do it for yourself so I'm like oh that's cool I want to do that Oh, I love that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, that is it for this episode. Do you have anything else that you would like to share with our listeners more about where they can find you, some of the content they can find from you? Yes. So you can find me at thriftsandtangles.com. I also am on Instagram and on YouTube. And over there, we just talk about thrifting, sustainability, and embracing our natural selves. So I do a lot of like thrift challenges where I give myself 10 minutes to run through the thrift store to see if we can find anything worthwhile. Um, And I just have a lot of fun with thrifting over there. So check me out. Yes, I love your YouTube channel. It's so fun. And if there's anyone out there, I know at the time of recording this, this is like the traditional engagement season. I'm an event planner. Um, so I know like this is like the traditional season. You have some great videos up about like how to do and have like a sustainable wedding, which, you know, it, I'm amazed at how beautiful your wedding was. Like it was so nice and like everything was like sustainable and had a very specific purpose. So be sure, you know, if, if you or someone that you know is getting married in this upcoming year to check out some of those sustainable spots because they Tyler had a amazing wedding it was great thank you yeah JJ was the reason my wedding turned out to be perfect I oh but on YouTube I talk about I found a dress for $400 on Facebook marketplace and it was like a thousand dollar dress I was so excited so yeah check out that content and JJ that wedding couldn't have happened without you so thank you All right, guys. So that is it from us today. Um, We talked about a lot. Everything is going to be in the show notes in terms of links. And I know I mentioned um, our book club and Buddy Read. It's the same thing. We use those two terms interchangeably. But please click the link in the show notes to see what we are currently reading and come join us. It's free to join. We're over on the Geneva app and we have other discussions kind of going on over there too. So if you're looking for a group to come gush about books with, or uh, just maybe read something that you're interested in, come check us out. Until next time, guys, talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Hey there. One last thing before you go. If you're looking for a group to read and chat about books with, I have the perfect solution. 
I'd love to invite you to join us on our current buddy read of Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall. We'll have a virtual meetup to discuss the book on Sunday, March 3rd. In addition to this meetup, we also keep a monthly chat going over on the Geneva app where we discuss the book throughout the month as we read. All the details on how to join, the date and time of the buddy read, and the link to the Geneva app can be found in the show note. All books mentioned in this episode can also be found in the show note. Thanks so much for joining us on today's episode and wishing you a wonderful reading adventure until we meet again. Chat soon.